Well, welcome to this webinar for Legs Matter Week 2023. Thank you very much for joining us. I believe we have quite a lot of people uh, that are registered for this event. So this is quite exciting and I can see the participants numbers going up. So I'm just going to um, introduce um, the panel shortly, but this is going to be a conversation. We want you to contribute to this conversation. This is a very important one for our citizens and for the workforce um, that is working within leg ulcer management. And so for today, there are no formal presentations, so we're not going to be sharing screens. Uh, we're just wanting to really have a good discussion and, um, and raise awareness about the challenges that we face. So we're here to talk about the underuse of therapeutic compression um, in the community services and why this is creating harm for our citizens. But I would also add to that harmful for our workforce as well. And this is all about system inaction and paralysis around some of these key uh, challenges we have. So this um, discussion is also about why we're calling it harm, but also how to tackle it. So it's great to have everyone on board. It's a very important topic is a very large topic so we're going to try and stick to this focus and um and we're going to be using the chat so you will as participants have access to the chat and to q and i um q and a <laughs> um and for you to really contribute to that and um and raise questions and challenges for the panel so if i can just introduce the panel um, we um, have, if I can just um, go in order from what's on the website, we've got Ms. Mr. Naz um, Ahmed, who's a vascular sur um, surgeon from Manchester University Foundation Trust. Welcome, Naz. We know that you've been doing an awful lot of work around um, uh, reduction in amputation, and, and I'm interested in the link to leg ulcers from the diabetic foot that you've been so involved in, and I know that you'll weave that in. Thank you. We've got uh, Mr. Manj Goel, which is, um, who is a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon from Cambridge University, and is also, I believe, chair of the uh, Venus Forum as well, is that the term, chair? Um, and, um, and you've been many years working in this environment as well, anything to raise the profile of um, in the importance of good care for people with venous leg ulcers. And so please weave that through the conversation. We've um, also got Zoe Lamour, who's service manager from specialist services in North Cumbria, integrated care, um, um, uh, integrated care system. Is, is, is that right, Zoe? Sorry, I'm guessing your title slightly wrong, I believe. Um, integrated Care NHS Foundation Trust. Fine, thank you. And so what's important for the work that Zoe's been doing is looking at how they transform care for our citizens with um, leg ulcers of all types and the challenges that they've had and how they've seen outcomes improve. So we're looking forward to you bringing in some of your experience um, and the changes you've wrought um, into the discussion. And then we have Dr. Crystal Oldman, who's Q and, um, uh, Chief Executive of the Q&I. And the Q and I have been incredibly supportive of the Legs and Matter campaign over the last few years and understand the link between um, the issues that we're raising and the community nursing workforce. And also the Q and I were very supportive of the document that we produced a couple of years ago, which was called Making Legs Matter. Thank you very much, Crystal. And we look forward to you weaving in your experience into this discussion. So um, we've got um, questions um, that uh, from um, the panelists as well. So if you have any topics that you would like to introduce, then please also use the chat and the question um, function as well. And so for all of you, be brave. This is a safe space. It is being recorded, but this is an important topic that we need to discuss and we need to challenge ourselves to do better. So on with the questions and on with the panelists discussion. So I would ask all of you and I'll take, as, as I see you, I'll take um, Zoe first. The question is, is why 
um, are you happy to use the term harm uh, when we talk about leg ulcer management? Well, I think for me, um, the fact that we label them chronic a lot of the time would suggest that we haven't quite hit the mark with um, getting it right every time. I also think that um, perhaps um, we haven't had the same emphasis on um, leg um, ulcers as we have on sort of other areas of um, health care. Um, and until we put that emphasis in place, I think, you know, patients do come to harm um, and they live with um, a reduced quality of life. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, and it's an interesting one, you talking about language as well, the use of the term chronic. And uh, we'll hopefully pick that up um, and uh, one of you can definitely develop that discussion further. Crystal, why are you confident and, and happy with using the word harm um, in this situation? Um, and no problem with using the word harm. And I think it's really important that we use that, that, that term. Um, and one of the things that strikes me in the document is, is about looking at this as mid-staffs. If all the patients that were coming to harm were in one building, this would be an absolute scandal. The other thing is that, reflecting on what you were saying, Zoe, is that we got this, I wouldn't say 100% right, but per, for pressure ulcer care, nurses are pretty good at that. And there was a massive campaign about 12 years ago. Um, and we're good at that. And we're good at collecting the data and we have loads of data and we know what to do, but we're not good at collecting the data. And we, but, but there's lessons to be learned from pressure ulcer care. And we should think about that as well. We often, um, Crystal, talk about the parallels with uh, pressure ulcers and why that changed and why this hasn't and it's a very useful parallel to talk about and I just noticed that someone in the chat mentioned that it, using the word harm is because this is avoidable and that's the whole point um, and the acceptance of chronicity may be a, a problem. Thank you Crystal. Naz, why are you happy to use that um, slightly bold word of harm? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. It, it all depends on definitions and what you mean by harm. Harm, um, if it's intentional, I think that's where people might start taking things personally and it's not meant to be personal for individuals or nurses in the community or doctors. So I think we just need to be careful in how we apply the term and make sure that people understand what it is. Um, I mean, we, we can take a lesson from uh, diabetic ulcer care. The reason why diabetic ulcer care improved over the last 20 or so years is because of a national policy to systematically improve diabetic ulcer care. And what we need to do is level up care to the diabetes standards. And this begins with all lower limb ulcers for, for non-diabetic foot ulcers, as well, as well as leg ulcers and lymphedema. We know from the diabetic uh, uh, data uh, of how to treat ulcers. And it's essentially it's quick assessment, time to first expert assessment is key. Uh, making sure that people can self-refer if they have it. And if you have those ingredients, ulcers will get better. So it's a, it's a systematic problem, not an individual problem. Uh, I, I agree. I think uh, one of the difficulties with using the harm word for some um, is that tendency to blame. And the learning from uh, some of the pressure ulcer work was the workload involved in that that was generated as well. So we do have to be cautious for sure, but it is about system um, change that we need to look at. And it's the system that is preventing uh, or creating that harm. Thank you, Naz. Um, Manj, what would you add to this from your experience? Yeah, so, so harm is an emotive word, isn't it? It's uh, We hear it particularly in, a, in the current situation in the NHS where the workforce is feeling fairly battered and I think we do have to be careful with the use of language but having said that what we have done very well in leg ulcer care is have a really impressive uh, portfolio of high quality research that tells us how to treat these patients effectively 
And so what we have is actually a standard that we should be achieving in pretty much every patient. And, and we're falling well below that standard as a, as a community, as a system. So, so I think harm is entirely appropriate. In a, in again, in a non-punitive, non-blaming way, uh, I'd almost say it's harmful not to use bold language like harm um, in order to really raise the profile. So, uh, but again, I reiterate what others have said. The idea is not for this to be punitive or to... to the blast and already, you know, stretched workforce. It's really just to highlight that we're falling below, or the system is falling below the standards that we would all want for our relatives, and um, and we need to to try and adapt things so we can improve that. So that's what I'd add, really. Very good. I think that's uh, falling below is in a really good um, phrase to use, and in actual fact, that's the opening statement of our making legs matter document. Um, it's that we know what we should be doing and we're not doing it and we're not doing it. So it's creating a problem and uh, and so on. Um, we have a poll. So whilst um, we put that poll up, thank you very much, Dawn. Poll number one. Um, so uh, please do contribute to this poll and we'll try and sort of turn it around uh, fast. So for you as people um, who are participating in this webinar, do you think the, the term harm is justified? Is it something you sort of feel uncomfortable with? Um, it's, it's an interesting one. When we were talking about this as legs matter, we were seeking opinions on this um, from a variety of people, from a variety of leaders. And there was a mixed response because of the danger of having it linked to blame. Um, and so we do have to tread carefully. But I suppose the thing that I often think about is if that was my mum or dad um, that had delays in the system, what would I be thinking of it? And I would know that that was really not a helpful thing to be uh, for them. And good. OK, so this is interesting. So everyone should be able to see the results here now. Thank you for being so speedy with your um, clicking on those buttons. So 79% yes, partly. And I think that's that's fair. Um, we do have to be um, careful um, with our language. We also have to be able to justify why we're using that phrase and, and give examples of harm as well. Um, and so it's very important to uh, qualify our statements so that it's clear that we are talking about system harm and, and it is about um, avoidable harm. Because as Amanda says, we have all this information. You know, it really shouldn't come as any surprise that a venous leg ulcer needs compression therapy to heal up. So um, is... Uh, the, the, the next sort of question that sort of flows from this is why? Why do we think there is inaction? Wh why are we, have we been paralyzed by this? And I'm going to flip it round. So Manj, why is it? You've been working in this field for many years. Um, you're chair of the Venus Forum. So around you and your experience, you would have seen good care and not so good care. But why are in action when there is this massive body of good research? Um, gosh, gosh, like like most of these complex issues, there are many, many layers to this, and many, many different factors contributing. I'll focus on maybe one or two little areas. Um, so I think that the basic level of education in um, both our primary care nurses, doctors, but also our patients is probably less than where we would like it to be. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I do feel for colleagues trying to manage lots of different conditions, but I think the level of education, particularly regarding the latest research and some of the myths that we need to dispel are very, very important. And, and so that's one aspect. I think the second aspect I'll touch upon without trying to cover everything is, is really the access to the basic primary assessment. So the, the prior to putting on compression therapy, it's important to get an arterial assessment, ideally an objective arterial assessment with an ankle brachial pressure index, for example. And we've just really struggled to have provision and education to have that type of resource available. Um, in an ideal world, that should be available the first time a patient presents with the wound on the lower leg, because um, that immediately opens the door to compression therapy. And, you know, in certainly in my area, 
sometimes patients are waiting months to get an ABPI assessment, which is which is really one big issue. So, so education and then access to the basics are the two things I'd highlight initially. Okay, and you know it's always an interesting one for me looking at education because I sort of feel like we've been doing this for years. You know, I got involved in the late eighties in uh, in leg ulcer management. And so we we often cite education as being the thing. Do you think there's another layer around the culture of acceptance that Zoe mentioned? Can you comment on that? Yeah. So, so look again. I, I want to be sensitive about um, about talking about very challenging healthcare circumstances, and, and but it is very difficult to change. You know, to turn the Titanic, which is what the NHS systems are, particularly when there are many factors pushing against you. And again, I'll, you know, the commissioning environment is not attractive for doing the right thing for these patients, for example. And, um, and, and also access to primary care. I mean, you know, anyone who's been in that 8 a.m. scrum to try and get an appointment in primary care understands how difficult these things are. So, you know, you know I, I, it's very easy to look at all the challenges and feel despair. But we have to be encouraged that we know what to do. There are many conditions where we don't know what the right thing to do is, but we know what to do. And we know that the burden is increasing. And we've got no choice but to improve what we're doing. Otherwise, you know, everyone's going to be inundated. Thank you, um, Manj. Um, Naz, what would you add to this around why, the whys? You, you're creating change with your team in Manchester. You know, what would you add to that? Not necessarily the how, but the whys. Uh, it's not sexy. It's as simple as that. Um, with uh, it's it's a. Uh, I don't think there's a, a powerful voice that's been heard consistently for several years. I know there have been people like yourself and, and others on the call who have been doing it, but there's not been a, a systematic movement to change things. And I think uh, the success that has been achieved, say for example, diabetic foot ulcers needs to be replicated with other with other conditions which are essentially the same thing and also in the foot and also in the leg some etiology behind it but essentially the argument is inequality why do we have really good treatment for diabetic foot ulcers and not so good treatment for non-diabetic foot ulcers like uh, uh, you know lymphedema and leg and, uh, and leg ulcers and it's simply because it just hasn't been pushed systematically. And I think uh, once there is a, uh, a comprehensive movement that gives a consistent message across the uh, ICSs and nationally as well, and there's a national strategy, building on the national wound care strategy that actually makes it happen. I think that's what's actually missing. Thank you. Yes, I mean, the national wound care strategy is an important um, driver for change here. And for, for anyone on, um, in the chat who is not aware, um, then we'll put the link in there to the lower limb uh, stream. There's an awful lot of work going on, lots of resources for people, business case to look at data and financial impact um, within your locality and so on. So um, do make the most of that. And we've got some early in implementation sites that uh, you know um, are coming online and, and providing the data um, that we need. Um, but sometimes even that doesn't necessarily influence people. Um, uh, somehow it's just as um, Naz is saying, it's just there isn't a strong enough voice yet to really tip it in the favor of um, our citizens. Um, Crystal, from your point of view, um, what would you add to this around the whys? You know, I'm just thinking from a workforce point of view from the community. So interesting, yeah, I think from the community perspective, there's something around education. There's uh, reflecting back on where I was a number of years ago before I came to the q and I was a dean in a university. And when I first came to that university a number of years before that, we, so we'd be talking the 19, late 1990s. We had leg ulcer short programs available for nurses and others, but mostly it was nurses working in the community, right the way up to full master's programs for tissue viability specialists. By the time I left the university 10 years ago, there was nothing. Not one program was being commissioned. So there definitely has been when I reflect back on that, there has definitely been a change to education, which means 
something that I don't know how to quite unpick the rationale for that was does it do we think that tissue viability is something that's taught in pre registration nursing programs, therefore it's not needed. Do we think it's not important because you know it's low level it's community, how difficult can this be let's just put a simple dressing here. That's also a bit of a culture around community that it's seen as lesser than that it's seen as less important than than hospital and. Colleagues will know, I always say, this is not a competition. Community and hospital are two different environments of care, but community very often is seen as the, the relative that wasn't invited to the wedding, shouldn't have been there. And really, you know, we've got to give them a bit of attention, throw them a few bones here and there, but really we're not going to put a whole education strategy in for this because really how difficult can it be? So I think there is a huge amount around the perception the, the, the way in which people imagine, those who do have the power to make change, imagine that work is done in the community as against the reality of how work is done in the community, which does play back to the, the, to the data as well. But I, I feel very strongly about education and there's, there's some in the chat, some, some comments in the chat box about the confidence. And if you have the education, the training, you have the confidence to put compression, to use compression appropriately, to assess, and to use the correct uh, and appropriate approach to the care. Yeah. I think it links, what you're saying also links to your first comment around the lack of data. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of the, the issues that all the panelists are raising, we can't see them boldly because we don't actually have the data. So if, um, uh, we're not using compression as we should. Um, we actually, we, it's more anecdotal than anything else, isn't it? Unfortunately, apart from um, some audit studies and so on. But, you know, we can't just press a button and go, how many people in our community are actually in therapeutic compression evidence-based care today? We wouldn't have that data. Um, and it puts us on a, a back foot, doesn't it, really? because it doesn't give us something to work with. Uh, so then to Zoe, because you have been looking at um, the change that you need to see and uh, the education um, that you've done that actually did link to that developing confidence for your staff. Um, what would you add to the whys? Why, why has there been inaction? maybe you know what preceded your work um <clears throat> i think it's competing demands in the community um not really clear um as to whose responsibility it perhaps lay with although it tended to sit with the community nursing team um i think it hasn't been um as as you said, um, sex, sexy, or it hasn't been prioritised, it certainly hasn't been commissioned or seen as a priority for commissioning. Um, and because the data hasn't been there, there hasn't been the driving factor to take it forward. And I think in Cumbria, um, we've got a bit of a two-pronged approach, really, because we are looking and we have started to capture our data using a digital platform. But we and alongside the the educational work that we we have been delivering, but that educational work came from the staff on the ground who said we can't keep doing what we're doing. We keep can't keep firefighting, um, and we need some help and support in the education and upskilling so that we don't have one individual in the team who understands like ulcers. We have a core group across the staff that can do that. And there was an appetite also from the unregistered staff as well to help support and understand and help with the preventative strategy. So that's really where we sort of started to um, spark the conversation and start to think about, well, how can we deliver this? Because there was over 240 staff looking to engage in it. And obviously that's a large number to put through a training programme whilst managing the backlog that we've seen as a result of COVID and the more complex work like end of life work and all that that comes through the door day in day out and can't be stood down. Thank you very much Zoe. I think um, um, some of the comments in the chat so I'm just going to pause here because Leanne 
Atkins, who's a, a vascular nurse consultant, is in the background looking at a very, very busy chat box. Um, Leanne, is there anything that you would like to pull out now, whilst also, Dawn, you get ready for poll number two, please? I think the yeah. biggest thing. I think the biggest thing that's coming out, um, Alison, is complete and utter frustration. I think is the word. Uh, national leadership is lacking. Um, we might have the standards, but they're not being implemented. We've got a postcode lottery. We have silos of working, and then surely this is not impossible. What would it need to make this change? We have the uh, the less little thing. I've worked in legal and management for many years. Why have we not improved this by now? And we just keep firefighting. So I think there's certainly a huge amount of frustration with our legs matter supporters out there, but there are some specific calls in terms of education. And the education that nurse professionals, and I see this all the time in the university, seems to be one of fear. Don't do harm, con con protect your patients you like that leads to an, an imposition and, and we have to remember that there is also harm in apathy if you like there is a direct question though that's come on the back of what crystal said in the chat and crystal the question is do you think that leg ulcer assessment education could or should be a prerequisite um, to any of the independent prescribing programs um, if, if people are within a community setting interesting question Crystal, would you like to comment on that? I could easily just say yes, <laughs> uh, because yes is the answer to that. Um, it's it, it, it's kind of without even needing to qualify it. It's if you think about the work that's being that's undertaken by uh, a, a dis, an average, if there is an average district nursing service, about forty percent of their work is dealing with leg ulcers. Yeah. So why would we not want to? emphasize this, have this as, as part of an independent prescribing program um, as well, at, which is a part of the district nursing program. But whilst I um, have got the microphone, I will say that for the first time in 12 years, the number of district nurses in England has fallen below 4,000. Has fallen below 4,000. Can you imagine for our population, the growing population of older people, more care in the community, and more end of life care at home and more wound care. We have fallen below the lowest number we've had in 12, 12 years. It's, it's shameful. If you pan out, this is fairly catastrophic, isn't it? That's the thing, is that we're not good at um, uh, sort of working out what that would look like in a few years time. Has any of the panelists got a comment on that before we go to poll number two, please? No, that's fine. I think Naz has oh. got his hand up, Alison. Oh, oh, I can see that hand now. Sorry, it's a bit covered with the yellow. But thank yes. you, Naz. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to add uh, on what uh, Manj and Crystal were saying. The, um, as, as we all know, um, healing uh, legals is, is all about the aggregation of marginal gains. There's a whole number of steps that need to come together for an ulcer to heal. It's not just about the ulcer and the dressing and the compression. It's about the whole leg. It's about the it's about the person as well, their environment, um, and you know obviously there are some steps which are more important than others, as Manj was saying with the doing a vascular assessment and putting them into compression. But one of the key things that is different in the system now is the ICS, and the whole point of ICS is, is to reduce inequality. That's on the that's right uh, that's their their biggest priority, particularly around core twenty plus five and managing chronic conditions. And what we often forget. Uh, when we treat leg ulcers, you know, the work from Julian Guest is that we often concentrate just on the leg ulcers. But if you add in the cost of the long term conditions, you've doubled the cost to several hundred million. Um, and so there's a whole strategy uh, for within ICS of managing long term conditions. And we need to link that to leg ulcers as well, because you can't treat leg ulcers without treating the whole person. And that sort of whole systems approach, I think, is, is, is where the opportunity is now with the new ICS structure. Couldn't agree more. So poll number two, please, um, Dawn. Lovely. Do you see around your health system that promotes an acceptance that leg ulcers are inherently difficult to heal? So that's a question for our participants this evening, please. 
if I can just add something to this um, question. Um, Zoe said something earlier about the use of the word chronic. And I find it very interesting that um, sometimes when you have a list of wounds on an app, it will be legal, it will be, uh, say, surgical wounds, and they might have the word acute next to them, uh, pressure ulcers, and then you have uh, chronic leg ulcers. And I just wonder what the panel thinks about our use of language um, for um, this, um, our citizens, where they have already been given that, um, that term, chronic leg ulcer, as opposed to an acute injury, or as opposed to um, uh, sort of a, a surgical wound that's on their lower leg that still needs to be treated with some form of uh, compression. Have we got any comments on that? just before we have the poll results, Manj. I, I couldn't agree with you more. All of these chronic ulcers, uh, as Leanne says over and over again, start as acute wounds. And if we get it right initially, the healing is much greater than this senescent, chronic, non-healing uh, wounds that we often get uh, faced with. So I think it's a, it's a, there is, and again, silly things like, only calling an ulcer a leg ulcer until it's been there for four weeks and only starting compression if it's been there for a certain period of time. You, you know, we really need to sort of challenge some of these um, dogmas that we've got. And, uh, and a very quick comment about compression. So a number uh, in the chat, I've been sort of trying to follow. It's very interesting. So there's a lot of apprehension around starting compression and, and the concerns about causing harm. So, so a number of studies continue to show if the ulcer is a leg ulcer between the ankle and the knee, even if there's arterial disease, there is venous hypertension, and they benefit from compression. And, I, and I, I would much rather see, if in doubt, people being put into modified compression rather than this sort of fear that I'm, you know, we must not cause any harm because a lot of studies would support that approach. Yes, I um, completely agree, Manj. The, the problem is, is that um, uh, often the nursing guidelines in a local trust prohibit people, literally prohibit people from doing uh, that and just doing the sensible thing. Yeah. And uh, it's a massive problem. And this is where the cultural shift needs to happen as well. And so even with the National Wound Care Strategy suggesting class one um, for, you know, or flight socks uh, for an early intervention, people are too concerned to do that. Um, and so it is something we're battling with there were quite a few comments here. Um, I noticed that someone was, um, I'm just trying to find out about um, chronic just suggests no way to heal. And the thing is, it does stop us from thinking we can do something fast with this. You know, um, a chronicity is such a, um, it just, you're on your back foot straight away. And there isn't a sense of urgency. And this is where the system needs to respond differently than our language does. I think. Um, thank you. Uh, Dawn, um, have we got the results of that? Thank you very much. So um, do you see um, a health system that promotes acceptance? So the good thing about that is that 27% say sometimes and 7% say no. <laughs> That's positive. <laughs> um, but there is an acceptance that leg ulcers are inherently difficult to heal. And uh, I know if um, when I've been speaking to nurse leaders, um, that is often, you know, it's seen as being in the hard box. And so, um, Zoe, have you got any comments on that particular poll result where, from your experience, you've been able to turn something around despite it being in the hard box or people? I'm sure when you started your workshops, there were quite a few people in the background going, well, I've been in this for a long time and I know that person's not going to heal. And then, hey, presto, they do with a bit of a focused approach. Have you got any comments on that? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we had anecdotally was that in one of the towns that we had, we had a street where the district nurse just worked the way up the street and it was all bilateral leg ulcers. And I thought, for me, as a leader, that just doesn't sit comfortably. Um, very efficient in that you can get your morning's caseload done, but um, you know, we shouldn't have patients in a street. Um, so that really for me was a turning point for we really need to do something here. So we did put the workshops on 
um, a theory based session and then a practical session working in with the staff with their patients on the ground, educating and upskilling them. And what we did see was them capture the caseload before and the caseload six, 12 weeks after. And for example, in one um, a district nursing caseload, um, a, a smaller um, team, they had 34 patients on the caseload with um, leg ulcers that could be classed as chronic um, with, you know, or non-compliant um, being the other. Yeah. Um, we haven't mentioned uh, that word. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and um, then about six weeks after they'd had their training and they'd invested and were much more confident, they were down to 15. So they more than half that um, just with the work and the support and the confidence um, to be able to do that. So it does show that level of investment that it can make a significant difference if delivered in the right way. Thank you very much, um, Zoe. Um, so um, one of the things that often we hear um, when we're presenting our sort of, you know, hopeful strategy to um, the commissioners or opinion leaders is that people often say, well, that's a no brainer. And then and everything pauses. So um, I, I'd like to just bring in anyone that has examples and Naz, you'd be the first person I'll bring in is about the sort of the, what have you done to tackle it? What's the story that seems to hit home? You mentioned um, inequality, and I wouldn't mind you sort of developing that further because it's an interesting one for the ICSs. Um, but you know, what stops or enables people to move forward from going it's a no brainer to action? So I think the, the key thing is to be able to speak the language of the people that you are actually speaking to. So I, as a vascular surgeon, I've had to learn to speak nurse, even though my partner's a nurse. I had to learn to speak podiatry. I also had to learn to speak commissioner. I had to learn to speak finance. I had to learn to speak strategy. And the way I did that was simply understand what are their priorities? What do they need to achieve? Everybody's got a tick box that needs to, that needs to be, that they need to achieve, that they are judged by even, you know, you know clinical directors and, and medical directors and, and people high up in, in strategy. And you, you can easily understand what they have to do just simply by reading the documents. I must have read over 150 documents around Greater Manchester's health plan for children, for adults, for long-term conditions, for this and for that. And there's a consistent theme that kept coming up. Furthermore, across Greater Manchester, you know, we are a Marmot city as well around inequalities. And with the way the government is moving around Core 20 plus five, it's all about reducing inequality. Therefore, you need to get all the data you can uh, and to tell a coherent story. And that story is firstly the clinical argument, which we all know, which is a leg ulcer, you know, basically stick in the compression and, you, and, you, you, and you'll get them healed. It's about managing long-term uh, conditions and it's about finance as well. And so we've got some data uh, for, for hospitals, for what does it cost to treat a leg ulcer in hospital? And what does it cost, cost to treat a foot ulcer in hospital? And the numbers speak for themselves. So, so to treat a, um, a the, year, the annual cost across Greater Manchester for treating foot ulcers is about half a million pounds. The cost of treating a leg ulcer in Greater Manchester is about 11 million pounds. It's about 20 times more. And you can simply put that down to there's much better community treatment, therefore people do not end up in hospital and there's a coherent story. So you've got a story for clinical and you've got a financial story to back that up. And there's, you know, there's intricacies within that which we've developed as well. And then the key one, which I've uh, spoken to commissioners about is around inequality. We know that for diabetic foot ulcers, that if you're diabetic, your foot ulcer is, you know, treated within an MDT setting and that reduces amputations. But we know that half of all major amputations and a third of minor amputations are in people who do not have diabetes and they cannot access those services. And we've got a situation where many podiatrists wish diabetes on their patient, therefore they can get uh, treatment. And the leg ulcer problem is three times that of diabetic foot ulcers, and there's even less going on. And with, as uh, Crystal was saying, you know, uh, up to you know half of all di um, district nurse work is wound care. And we're not getting those ulcers healed. If we get those ulcers healed, we kind of free up nurse time 
Uh, you know, and the other thing that many district nurses do is administer insulin several times. So if they're on a the long acting insulin, they have to give that uh, fewer uh, fewer times a day. You freed up more nurse time. So these are the arguments that you that you need to present around finance, around inequality, around freeing up time and creating capacity within the space. What we did within Manchester then worked with the strategic clinical network. And the strategic clinical network uh, sort of gives us the opportunity to understand who do you need to speak to in, in the system. So within Greater Manchester, as I'm sure within all your health system, who controls things? I have no idea who's in charge. And you, you kind of think, you know, it's some sort of a, a Kaiser Soze figure that controls everything. It doesn't exist. There is nobody. Nobody knows who that one person is. And as a vascular surgeon, it's like, you know, we, we're kind of used to, I make a decision, I'm in charge, the book stops with me, I do it. Who is that? when it comes to you know strategy and the whole thing well we think somebody's in charge and we kind of go to them and say well not really so one of the things i think uh, the lessons that from greater than manchester are number one go and speak to the commissioners go and speak to strategy go and speak to the clinical directors and the medical directors say what are your priorities and read the documents that they are reading and then you know shape your argument in a way that will understand and we have to help them understand there's also uh, an onus on us as vascular surgeons, man, you know, where are the vascular surgeons in all of this? All right. We don't particularly find leg ulcers interesting. We don't find them sexy. And apart from a handful of vascular surgeons, there aren't many people pushing for it. So I think as vascular surgeons, we need to take this mantle on. And, uh, and I'm really grateful, you know, man is one of the pioneers and written all the papers. And he's one of the guys I, I quote uh, very often. And also on commissioners, well, they don't they don't understand leg ulcers. Well, you know, they need to speak to their medical directors so that they can understand them as well. You know, people need to start taking responsibility for the position that they are in and know that they can affect the system. I'm now going to step off my soapbox <laughs> uh, and let somebody else uh, uh, say something. Um, I think it's interesting uh, about taking responsibility for for the system, you know, and um, and uh, personally, I found that a real challenge for uh, knowing who's in charge, who's going to be making these decisions, who do we even present to, uh, because uh, it's it's not straightforward. And of course, you know, we have been through an awful lot of upheaval lately uh, in the NHS uh, pandemic, plus the ICSs. And so who to go to is quite uh, challenging for no, all of us. Can I, can I just come back um, on that? I think you're absolutely yeah. right. I think the last five, six years has been really difficult because of COVID and also the change as well. But everybody kind of knew that all this change around ICS was coming, particularly the last two years. And that's why there's been huge inertia because nobody knows whether they're going to have a job, who's in charge, how the money flows. And now that all that is kind of settling down and we kind of know we kind of know the structures now, I think over the next two, three years are the real opportunities, particularly with many ICSs who are now creating their five year plan. We now need to get into those uh, plans. Absolutely. Um, um, Manj, Zoe or Crystal, who would like to comment now? Um, just looking at time, we've got half an hour left. Who else would like to talk about what's stopping us and how how to tackle it? You know, step. Crystal. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to build on what Naz was saying, uh, because I think we do have an opportunity as nurses with the ICSs. We now have chief nurses. Some of them have changed. Some have been interim, but there's 42 chief nurses now. This is primarily a nursing issue, which is also gives us a challenge, um, because when it's a nursing issue, it tends to get lower importance. Um, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic, Manj and Naz, that you're here championing the work that is done by your, your community as vascular surgeons, but also you recognise the role of nurses here. So what I'm, what I'm also thinking is that the QNI runs, uh, has just started running a network for the chief nurses of the ICSs, so there's 42 of them, and they belong to our network. And here we have um, a, an opportunity to do just what, Naz, just what you said around getting the messaging right, understanding what their priorities are. Yes, it's about inequalities, but they'll have a hundred other priorities. So how do we get this one in front of them to say this is the no brainer and this is how we can help you to get this right. So on my on my to do list now, Alison, is to invite you to come and meet with them. We meet every month online and to and to come with the data, the evidence and how can we help you uh, to do this? Um, sorry, to I, I don't mean to 
No, I'm that's fine it, too, <laughs> Alison. <laughs> no, it's fine. But uh, it this sort of links into what Zoe was saying about releasing time to care. This is a massive priority. If people are doing things, however kindly, but are not effective, it means their workload is double what they need to be. And and if we can get people to truly believe that it isn't in the hard box, that it can be turned around, um, that will be a brilliant um, you know lesson learned for us all. Manj. Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying listening to all the comments. I agree with basically everything that's been said. Um, I'll add three quick things. Um, one is one of the best sticks we can use to drive change is high quality data. Um, and good information. Um, yeah. Often just visualizing the inequality and the extent of the problem is all that's needed to drive some positive change. So we, we need to really use that as a, a really important stick. The second comment is to say, yes, it's primarily a nursing issue and that that's where the patients first present. But, you know, us vascular specialists can't absolve ourselves from responsibility because the underlying problem is often the veins and we need to fix the underlying pathophysiology because that's what gets them healed quicker. That's what stops the ulcers coming back in the future. That's what stops these patients. So 50% of the patients we see will have had a previous ulcer. That's a previous missed opportunity to deal with the underlying problem. So that's the second comment. And the third comment is, um, look, money is what makes the world spin. Um, and it's the, an unequivocal fact that if we treat these people well, we save money. That's not even considering the amount of time freed up by you know hardworking community colleagues to do other things we save money so i think we just got to use these sticks to hit as many people metaphorically as we can um, to try and drive these messages home and i think uh, that links very nicely what Naz said at the beginning which is about using their language you know we have to find out what the hooks are and how we plant them on those strategic hooks to help people understand what we're saying, that we're not just on our clinician soapbox because that's all we, you know, we're keen on is this group, but it, it's, it is a system-wide issue. The final sort of couple of questions are about our citizens. So how do we advocate for our citizens? So this is where I'll be bringing in uh, Zoe, but also Leanne, uh, because on the Legs Matter Coalition, we have a few patient uh, partners and I have to say, it's a massive learning experience working alongside people who experience health services and also have their view of the world and what we're talking about. And I know that Tracy, um, one of our patient partners, has uh, wasn't able to attend today. So she wrote a few things down, Leanne, that um, we could share um, to do with harm, her view of the world. So I've been sharing some of these already within the text oh, as we've gone you. through. Um, things like, really, um, nobody talks about harm from a patient point of view or to the patient. I know we all talk about duty of candour, but only when something's gone wrong, if you like. We don't talk about system failures with our patients. And Tracy just pointed out, you know, please, please never underestimate the psychological harm. It can't be measured. It's completely... Um, overloading if you like when you're in that situation she also calls for a real change in the language stop assuming that patients with leg ulcers will never heal it sets a precedent it stops people from trying it becomes a transactional dressing change if you like and really her greatest thing is we need to get rid of this postcode lottery every patient deserves good care Manj, as me and you have many conversations, as soon as you start talking about venous intervention and I talk about the requirement of treating the underlying pathology, we get back. It's a postcode lottery that many um, healthcare uh, authorities are seeing this as a cosmosis, if you like, rather than a consequence. And, and really, we need to drive that change. But I think the greatest comments that's been happening just before you go on to the citizenship is a few comments, really. Yes, please. About, really, um, the lack of overall respect of the value of community services in terms of that community nursing. And I call it lack of respect because there's a lack of respect in terms of the investment, the education, the retention of that workforce. Surely that community service is part of our biggest NHS provision, if you like, to help with all of that acute burden. We have a taskalization happening of community nurses and therefore how does all of that help? And I'm sure 
Crystal will agree with all of those comments, but the challenge back is we know the number of qualified district nurses are reducing. The workforce has changed dramatically in terms of our community bases. But there is some actually saying that, you know, our non-registered nurses here can really champion this with us. And there is something about investing in those non-registered nurses to grow our own talent, if you like, within that service. But what we really need to do is to work as part of that bigger, wider MDT, allowing those nurses to directly refer to vascular and breaking down all of those borders. So I'd just like to put all that into the mix before you go on to talk about the citizenisation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is anything uh, particularly jump out at any of the panellists that you'd like to comment upon from that? We'll move on to um, our advocacy. Um, there's, we've got a poll actually, Dawn, if you're able to um, put that up as well. One of the things for um, uh, uh, suboptimal care is that sometimes we don't actually recognise it or label it as that as well. So, um, so the poll three, the last one is, does identifying delays or suboptimal care as harmful create a better focus for ad advocacy? Can we talk better with our patients or is there a danger that that can also blur into the um, discussion that we were having earlier around blame as well? So let's see what people um, think about that as well. Um, it's, a, it's a tall order sometimes to have some of these open discussions with people because you do feel that you are possibly blaming the previous um, clinician that they came into contact with. So we do have to be mindful of that. And as um, Man said earlier, there's multiple reasons why someone may not have had um, the care that they should have received. But is there a different conversation to be had? Would anyone like to comment? Oh, we've got the poll results. So 53% uh, yes, possibly yes. So any comments on this from the panelists? What do we think is, is the reason for the possibly yes? And also the contributors in the background can add to why they put possibly yes or any information manage. Um, I think these are very difficult conversations to have and, and culturally um, it's not something that many people are used to doing that level of you know almost self-flagellatory honesty with patients um, I'm not even sure that's a word I apologize um, <laughs> but but uh, I think I think what is clear so, so I think I think the patients are the key to this if if patients knew what that their condition was eminently treatable and the outcomes that could be you know expected then I, I think they quite rightly they'd be pretty outraged by by deficiencies in that and and I think the key is to empower patients again another great legs matter idea in the past has been the idea of this patient patient passport or patient um, you know a list of what they could expect with their leg ulcer and if they're not getting you know at these different aspects of their care for, for them to go and seek out help and to actually you know, knock knock on the GP's door or knock on the, you know, just to really empower them to get that help. That's one aspect, but also the empowering them with compression. Uh, and these these new adjustable garments that are now available are really changing the the paradigm in terms of what patients can do for themselves. So, um, so I think patients are the key. They, they you know, they're, they're the ones that live and suffer with all of this. Um, so empowering them really is the key, I think. Go on, Naz. Yeah, just to sort of just to uh, build on that, to say that I think it, it's, it's, this is part of the suite of arguments that you use with commissioners. You have to have the patient's voice as well. And if we say that, you know, we are, uh, you know, causing harm to patients, that is a really powerful argument on top of all the other arguments. Uh, I think all of these arguments uh, are important. I mean, for Legs Matter, actually, for those of you that don't know, actually sort of came about in sort of, I think, about 2016 when uh, a group of clinicians sort of sat down and went, well, we haven't created change um, and the patients aren't necessarily aware that we haven't, um, what can we do? And so Legs Matter, the website is full of resources for people. And one of the latest ones to go on was done by the patient partners in the coalition, just to help them understand who is who in um, healthcare. And, uh, you know, from the healthcare assistant, the vascular surgeon, what should they be expecting from them? 
and a lot of the um, downloadable resources are about what you should expect. So without necessarily labeling it as suboptimal or harm and blame, um, we're trying to say, this is what you should expect. Go for that, ask about this, this and this. And we have a lot of patients that also write to us that the coalition have to respond to. And they are often about, I've had this leg ulcer for two years, or my mother has, and I don't know what else to do, you know. And so we're trying to advocate for them by helping them with greater knowledge, sort of um, enabling them to have better conversations with their clinicians so they know what they should either expect or ask. Um, Zoe, in your work, what sort of patient involvement did you have across, your, uh, across North Cumbria? Um, so with doing it in-house and um, providing the practical, um, you know, um, competency, um, you know, the, we had um, the individual who was delivering the training actually going out alongside um, the staff. So there was one-to-one -one conversations with patient and engagement with patients, understanding about what the patients wanted to get out of it. Um, and to change that, that culture of the way conversations were perhaps previously being addressed um, and really get into the nitty gritty of what happened with, with uh, or what the patient's expectations were. I think that was the fundamental thing um, for helping to change um, perhaps the way that those difficult conversations were previously perhaps not being as effectively had. Um, and then um, since then, um, we've got some patients who have um, been so kind as to give us statements around the benefits to the practice that they've seen and the interventions that they've had and their experience and shared that, you know, to spread the, the good word, shall we say. Thank you. We found within the Legs Matter campaign that um, hearing stories, talking to people have, have really um, enabled people to be more empowered in their own personal situation as well um, and to learn from others' experiences um, as well. So I, I think the final area, um, we've already touched on this, was really about how we link this campaign, Legs Matter, as well as the need for optimal therapeutic compression to the recruitment and retention and also um, coming back to I believe um, I think it was Naz uh, talked about how we make people accountable I'm trying to remember who said what now but um, Crystal how do we align this campaign this need to uh, improve leg ulcer management to recruitment and retention so but community recruitment. staff, sorry, in yeah. particular. Uh, so um, nurses generally working in the community absolutely love wound care. It's one of the things that we, the satisfaction of seeing a wound heal is absolutely thrilling. And it doesn't go away. As long as you are a nurse, that's what you do and you love it. So bringing back the joy and the joy comes from having the confidence and competence to do the right thing. And action and activity is seen as by the patient, our citizens is seen as, well, I'm being cared for and they're coming every day or they're coming three times a week. So they're taking care of me, it's lovely. But actually, if you're not doing the right thing and you're not seeing the leg ulcer heal, then you're not getting the satisfaction, but you sometimes as a nurse don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So for me, it does come back to education again, and um, there's been some fantastic work as Zoe and colleagues have and, and colleagues in Cumbria have identified. What you're doing there is amazing. We're not very good at, at share. At, you're, you're very good in Cumbria at sharing. We're not very good in the NHS generally at sharing this. But we have we also have to think that this is about citizens that are being seen in community, are being seen in care homes, in nursing homes, um, and in primary care. So there's a Back to the ICS, there's an opportunity here to influence around the education, and that's one element of it, but the education and training right across all the services in any one population. 
and linking it to money, to data and to the evidence. Thank you. Um, anyone else around how we link recruitment and retention of staff to this, Manj? Uh, I think virtually every healthcare professional, whether in the community or secondary care, um, when you look at their motivations, they want to make a difference. They want to do something positive for their patients. And what they've got in this field is an incredible opportunity to make a really big difference because of the volume of work that's out there. And, and I think events like this and actually having giving empowering people with the education, the knowledge, but also giving them the, the license to use their instincts within a safe framework is what we need to do more of. Um, you know, we can't, you know, we talked about the, some of these very strict protocols. You know, if I get another referral for an ABPI of 1.32, I think I might pull out my remaining two hairs. It's, um, <laughs> I think we need to, we need to really, um, you know, recognize that we, we can overcomplicate things. And I've just, you know, I've noticed in the chat, you know, talk about some, you know, more complex issues about very overweight patients or lymphedema or all of these other aspects. The vast majority of these ulcers can be healed with effective early compression, appropriate treatment of their venous disease. And, you know, lymphedema is just a failure of the lymphatic system. Any swollen leg effectively has lymphedema. They need the same treatment. So I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but for the vast majority of people, we don't need to worry about these, these things. Good compression, appropriate early care, appropriate referral for vascular treatment. I, I often think I'm in um, leg ulcer management because of the feel good factor. And that's the interesting thing, because a lot of people um, think it's like, oh, it's all doom and gloom. It absolutely isn't. You can do something really creative um, that is incre incredibly effective, very fast. So I always think I'm in a great job. Um, so, uh, and I think we do overcomplicate things. Um, there was a couple of, um, I'm mindful we've got about 15 minutes left. So, I'd really like to pull in any um, conversation, Leanne, um, from your point of view that you're seeing. I've seen a comment about uh, what about self-management, which sort of links in very nicely to workforce <laughs> as well as um, uh, empowerment of our citizens. I think, yeah, there's a couple of things to start off with there. The one thing I would say is there is a fantastic, across the whole of the UK, Legs Matter supporters, lovers, there is pockets of brilliance happening and it gives me such hope in terms of the future. I think what we need to do is to take these little tiny Lego bricks though and learn to either build or laterally spread them. I love what Crystal said in terms of bring back the joy. Who doesn't want a job that they loved going to? And then there were some great comments of let's not blame, let's see the issues, let's support each other, bringing back that compassionate leadership that we talk about often within the NHS. There's also some really good points in terms of that. How do you have that open, honest, empowering conversation linked to that self-supported management? And where do we get the education as nurses to do that? Because I've never been educated in patient activation or motivational interviewing. So actually, how do we do all of that? And then linked with that, isn't there a huge nugget that we haven't talked about today in terms of prevention, primary prevention or secondary prevention of recurrence? And all of that really is linked to patient activation. Absolutely. Um, if I can make a comment on that, because we've done some work around patient activation and we have staff trained in motivational interviewing, link into the ICS, link into the primary care, that's where it happens most. And uh, there are often uh, free um, training programs on these areas. And not everyone needs to be in, um, you know, trained in this, but for the complex, the conversation is very different once you've had that training. Um, so I would encourage people to look at um, patient activation um, uh, measures as a training program and motivational interviewing. It's amazing the difference it would make. Uh, Naz, I see you'd like to contribute to that. Yeah, so um, one thing we're doing along those lines, but in a sort of more uh, systemic way, is working with public health. So for, across Greater Manchester, we have a, an organisation called GM Active, uh, and they uh, run all the council gyms uh, across Greater Manchester. So they have access to 100 uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, facilities and have over 3,500 staff. And they are trained in this sort of thing. Huh. 
why don't we just work with them? Yeah. And one of the things we're doing in Greater Manchester is understanding how we can bring public health closer with clinical pathways. They have the they have the facilities and meet patients in them, and because they've got a problem with getting people through the doors, and we have all the patients that need their services. So we need to do a huge, uh, you know, and we are doing a huge amounts of work in organizational change and bringing people together to have a, to have a conversation where they become confident in treating some of these patients and we become confident in being able to refer uh, to those services. And that, and that and we've got a huge workforce that we can tap into and increase capacity without actually increasing cost to the NHS. Partnership working, knowing what's happening locally and linking in so that um, your work can be shared and halved if, you, if someone's already doing it. Uh, Manj. Just to build on that, so um, having a leg ulcer has a major negative impact on the quality of life of the sufferer, but also their carers. Mm -hmm. um, that's been objectively demonstrated by a number of studies. So actually, they are um, also other people to bring into the conversation. They're okay. the people that deal, you know, with the distressed relative, but also the person that has to, you know, give up days at work to take people into appointments and all this sort of stuff. So, so I think the carers also have a big stake in this, and and they are also very motivated to support and help. So, just to just to add that to the discussion, really. Absolutely. And what we haven't talked about is part of the system is the, the worth of pharmacists, local pharmacists um, in directing people into early use of compression um, as well. I know that pharmacy was mentioned in the in the chat as well. Um, one of the things um, I think uh, possibly, Manj, you talked about was the myths um, that um, uh, we uh, seem to inherit in uh, leg ulcers um, and I just wondered whether there was any myth that would be useful when it comes to looking at how we optimize the use of compression therapy what's the one myth that gets you apart from the 1.32 ABPI needs a vascular referral uh, that's the biggest by far I mean there's a few there's a few I, I think so the heart failure discussion I think has come and gone a lot mm. um, so, it, it, the, so the issue is theoretically there is a risk that the putting on compression can lead to fluid shifts, which can affect people's heart failure. Um, it, in my experience and from the evidence, that really is a myth. Unless somebody is really badly decompensated, in other yeah. words, virtually in hospital, compression is perfectly safe to use in heart failure. And, and I, I really would encourage that, you know, the, the default is almost almost to use compression. That, you know, again, the 50-50 yeah. is you use compression. Likewise with the low ABPIs. So, you know, very good um, leg ulcer service in Gloucestershire have for 27 years, I think, had a protocol where down as low as 0 0.5, uh, they've been using modified compression with very close supervision. And their healing rates actually presented last week at the Venus Forum are very, very close to those with purely venous disease. Um, so it's just to, again, to empower people. Yes, it needs to be done safely. Yes, it needs to be with supervision, but it's perfectly safe to compress these people with leg ulcers, not foot ulcers, leg ulcers we're talking about. I would agree. We would have the same uh, protocols. And I think why we feel confident doing that is one, it, it makes sense, but also because we have a system where um, any red flag can be uh, dealt with very swiftly. Um, and so uh, I think where there is a good system, a cohesiveness around uh, care and the pathways, then you can be bolder, should be able to be bolder with that um, and use our brains. Nas. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, one, one of the reasons uh, that people aren't put in compression is that sometimes it's difficult and painful to do an ABPI uh, for many patients. And what we've started doing, and I, I know many other places do as well, is use the toe pressure. And the toe pressure, you can actually get relatively quickly, and, and it's actually much quicker to, to do than an yes. ABPI. Yeah. Uh, and that is a really good way of getting a vascular assessment and bringing people into compression without causing pain. Absolutely. So there is usually a solution. Um, I'm going to start to draw this to a close. So I'm going to bring Leanne in again. If there's anything you would like to add, Leanne, what have we heard from the um, panellists, uh, the sort of key messages and from the participants in the chat? I think the number one thing is frustration across the board. 
I think that we are all on the same song sheet for once. We want levelling up. And I love the phrase that was put in the chat. Let's level up this service. So it doesn't matter where, what type of wound you've got below the knee, where you access your services, you get to the right front door every single time. I think we need to think about the language we use, both within our own circles and towards our patients. And let's always remember, apathy towards this is also harmful. And so I, I think it's been a fantastic debate tonight and really, really showcase some of the frustrations, but also some of the glimmer of hopes that's been happening. I urge all of you panellists to go back and have a read of the chat, because actually there are some huge, massive glimmers of hopes within all of that. Thank you very much, Leanne, and thank you for monitoring this, because there was no way I could do that as well. Um, also, just to say that um, there was... Um, uh, we've got a 10 point action plan and I would really love people to look at that fresh with what we've just been talking about. Look at that and see which one resonates with you and why is that? And also for all of us to think, OK, what can we go away and do based on this discussion today? I'm really, really grateful for the free flowing discussion we've had this evening. I'm really grateful to the panelists for agreeing to um, put themselves out this evening for this event.